just with that, yeah. I no. had a technical problem. I too. can see that the revival of growth in the world economy requires the removal of the kind of constraints that neolib that, that that finance capital, globalized finance capital places on all the various actors. Now, what comes be beyond glo uh, globalized finance capital? Is there a phase of capitalism beyond neoliberal capitalism? I don't know. But as yet, nobody is talking about it. You know, in the interwar period, when there was a Great Depression, people like Keynes were talking about uh, a new kind of capitalism where there'll be state intervention. Okay, and in fact, the New Deal of Roosevelt was a way of introducing that sort of a capitalism, which in the post-war period got institutionalized. Therefore, in some sense, during the crisis, people had some idea of what, how to come out of it. At the moment, nobody has any idea of how to come out of it. Okay, and consequently, then nobody has any idea of where to go beyond neoliberalism. Now, I'm a socialist. It's not my job to find ways of where capitalism should go beyond neoliberalism. So, 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 but, but even capitalism themselves don't have any idea. Uh, you were talking about one of the solutions you gave is delinking. You said that uh, some. For third world countries, it is possible to delink, you, you are saying. You know, this linking itself is recent. I mean, you know, it began in the 80s or 90s. I mean, there, there was a long period before decolon after decolonization, before neoliberalism, when they were delinked. So delinking is not a new thing. The only thing is that now there would be a massive attack from the US, which is immediately going to ask for sanctions against you from globalized finance that would start a capital flight. So so there would be there would be ways of subverting your delinking project. Okay. Which might create transitional difficulties, difficulties in, in, in uh, when you do it. But on the other hand you have to weather them, you have to you have to overcome them. Okay. I'm not saying it's an easy uh, uh, option, not at all. It's it's difficult. You have been talking about delinking as a regional process because uh, you said that a country, and you have seen countries that wanted, for example, to delink from the Franc CFA but got totally asphyxiated uh, by, uh, by colonialist or imperialist powers. So if, if, if we are going to prioritize three um, main things we have to delink, um, what would they be? Capital flows, free capital flows. The main thing we have to delink from is free capital flows. Because the moment you do any alternative policy, which finance doesn't like, they would start flowing out. The Moody's would downgrade your credit rating, finance would start flowing out. So you have to have controls on capital leaving the country. But of course, if you put controls on capital leaving the country, it wouldn't come inside. If it doesn't come inside, then you'll have problems meet financing your trade deficit or your current account deficit. And therefore, you'll have to have some trade controls. And these trade controls would then be further buttressed by the fact that the United States is going to impose sanctions against you. Okay, So, so some kind of trade and capital controls would become necessary if you de-link. In fact, that is the meaning of de-linking. Okay, uh, but the point is that, and that's going to create problems because that's going to, uh, then they'll tell people that look, uh, what a government you have is creating difficulties for you and so on. You allow capital to come in and then you'll have goods and, and so on. Uh, you'll have <laughs> deficits, but people don't bother about it. So, so people have to be prepared for it. Okay, so, so uh, any kind of progressive government would have to prepare the people for it, would have to take them into confidence, explain to them, and on the basis of that dealing. I think, I think progressive opinion mm. has to prepare people for it. Does that go to education? Well, education, I mean, look, public meetings are education. In other words, education doesn't mean you'll just be an MA in universities. <laughs> I'm not saying we should wait till everybody has acquired an MA degree yes, before we delink. Yes, there can be popul popular, uh, popular universities. There can be, but, but, but on the other hand, the, these things may have to be done much faster than 
then education has percolated down to the entire population, which it should, but on the other hand, that will take time. But, you know, educating people is not just through universities. A public meeting is an education. A, a street demonstration is an education. So, so in that sense. But I think that the government are... Um, somehow uh, constrained by uh, their agreements, free trade agreements or investment treaties. So uh, they are, it's like a trap. So how can they uh, uh, break free from this trap, from these chains of uh, free trade agreements and investment treaties? No, but, <coughs> no, but, but you, you see, this is another thing that, that third world governments are trapped in the United States when it signs a treaty that treaty is not accepted until it is ratified by the Congress but the third world governments don't do that they simply go and sign treaties but I think we should also insist that if we have the popular mandate we should back out of treaties what about the, the multilateral uh, institutions like the WTO that are right now facing some consensus issue, let's say, or some decision-making process issues? Uh, are could this be a, a sort of a, a, yeah, a, sort of a symptom of uh, something, uh, a new system, and uh, the back end of uh, are we reaching the back end you're talking about with this crisis in the multinational multilateral uh, systems? But the WTO has not been fair to the third world. You know, had it been, then I would have had great hopes in it. But it has not been fair to the third world because forget about the intellectual property rights agreement that's obvious but but you know even in matters of india is having a quarrel with wto on the question of food subsidy uh, in fact that is where the doha round of negotiations has been halted because what they say is that if you procure you know if you are going to have a public distribution system you have to procure in other words you have to buy from the from the peasant producers. You buy from the peasant producers at pre-fixed prices. Okay. Now they are saying that that is something which is interfering with the market. Now if India did not do, a, do it then India would not be able to run a public distribution system. If you don't run a public distribution system, millions of people are going to starve. So, so WTO has not been fair to uh, the third world countries. You, if uh, we finish maybe with your comment about the uh, RCEP, uh, because, uh, yeah, because yeah, it was two days RCEP. ago, so... Yeah, uh, yeah. No, I think the RC... I'm very glad that the government of India has not signed the RCEP because the RCEP would have meant lower prices for a range of commodities which would have brought distress to the peasantry, okay? Some people argue that there would have been a dumping of industrial goods also from countries like China and so on that would have created unemployment, whether that happens or not. But certainly the peasantry has been completely opposed to the RCEP. And I therefore believe India should not sign the RCEP because I, you know, this notion that somehow competition is a good thing, I, I don't accept. You know, because after all, it's very important that there be full employment in the economy. If they did the peasantry are under distress, if the workers are unemployed because of competition, then I would say that down with competition. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you for your time. Thank you.